And so I want to welcome everyone to the Roger E. A. Arndt Fellowship Ceremony with a distinguished lecture by Professor Carniaticus to follow. Um, and so now I'm going to turn everything over to Director Shen. Thank you, Claire. Okay. Welcome everyone to Roger Arndt Fellowship Ceremony and a distinguished lecture by Professor George Carniaticus. Yeah. Uh, let me first say uh, a few words about the fellowship. The Roger Aunt Fellowship was established last year to honor our former director, Professor Roger Aunt. Okay. And, uh, and this is the second year for the um, fellowship ceremony. And soon, okay, we are have a student, uh, student award, uh, award winners uh, advisor to introduce <laughs> the award winner this year. So let me first uh, say some words about Professor Aunt first. And the Professor Aunt, he got his PhD degree from MIT in 1967, and then he went to Penn State to become a faculty member there, and he stayed there for ten years. Tia University of Minnesota stole him from Penn State. <laughs> and uh, Professor Roger Aunt served as uh, lab's director for 16 years. And after that, he went to NSF to serve as the program director for fluid mechanics at NSF for three years. Okay. And uh, Professor Roger Aunt himself is a um, distinguished um, researcher in fluid mechanics. His research areas covered um, cavitations, um, hydropower, hydraulics, and um, hydroacoustics, among many other things. He has written more than 200 papers, and his influence is, is uh, felt around, uh, uh, around the world. Yeah. And uh, um, Professor Aunt, he made significant contributions to the uh, St. Anthony Foss Laboratory, and as we know, the entire fourth floor, the wind tunnel, that lab, uh, you know, that entire development was uh, 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 initiated by Professor Out. And also, with, during his tenure as a lab director, he diversified the lab faculty from multiple to multiple uh, departments. Yeah. And when he was at NS NSF, then he significantly promoted uh, the fluid mechanics research for the entire country. So thank you. Roger, okay. and uh, also I want to, to thank Raj and Jean for their continuous support to the students at the St. Nicholas Laboratory. So starting with the last year, then the lab established this fellowship. Each year we select one student winner among all the several students who perform research in fluid mechanics area. And this year I'm going to ask the student's advisor Professor John Gallifer to introduce the student. John. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction, Leon. I have known uh, Roger Arndt personally for 45 years, first as an instructor, then as a supervisor and mentor, and finally as a colleague. And so, Roger, it has been my honor to have known you so well and for so long. The recipient of the second Roger E. A. Arndt Fellowship is Vinnie Taguchi, who has been making an impact on the academics and the student environment at SAFL for some time, with Jacques Finley and myself as his co-advisors. Vinnie came to us from North Carolina State University, where he was active in the undergraduate research and was the first author on a refereed journal article and recipient of an award for a poster presentation based upon the research. So Vinnie came to the University of Minnesota with a research background and has since published four additional referee journal articles, been invited to deliver, invited to deliver 12 talks, given 40 additional presentations, and has been awarded the best student paper and the best student poster at separate North American Lake Management Society conferences. So Vinnie has been busy. Vinny has also been involved in many activities inside and outside the University of Minnesota. Now, I don't have time to mention them all, but one example is his leadership of the Midwest District and the Midwest Chapter of the Japanese American Citizens League, for which he was interviewed on YouTube by George Takei of Star Trek fame. 
So it is my pleasure to introduce this short presentation by Vinity Gucci as the recipient of the 2022 Roger E. A. Arndt Fellowship. Well, thank you very much, John, for that introduction. Um, it's an honor to be acknowledged in the same sentence as uh, Professor Arndt. Uh, I, I don't believe we've had the, the I haven't had the honor of meeting you in person uh, in my time at SAFL, uh, but I'm glad to finally share some space with you virtually. Um, so in the interest of time, I will get right to it and I won't keep you all too long uh, before the very, even more impressive talk to come. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about some work that I've been doing with several folks from SAFL, uh, my advisors, John Gulliver and Jacques Finlay, but also some other SAFL researchers, Ben Jenke, Bill Herb, and Purnima Natrajan. Uh, and we've been exploring uh, urban stormwater ponds, which many of you in Minnesota are quite familiar with. Uh, but specifically, we're looking at how to deal with the fact that many of them export phosphorus and what some of the potential remediation strategies might be in dealing with that. And so this is research funded by uh, primarily by MnDOT. So the basic expectation for a stormwater pond is that you're going to have urban runoff coming in that's going to be full of all kinds of pollutants and different contaminants that are common in an urban landscape. And we hope that most of them will be captured by the pond and particularly that they will uh, settle to the bottom of the pond so that the water that then flows out of the pond is going to be much cleaner and we can have nice clean and healthy lakes and other aquatic ecosystems downstream. But what we're finding more and more um, is that many of these ponds behave quite differently. We see that the water in the ponds, instead of being a, a nice clear blue, is bright green. And there's quite a bit of phosphorus and other nutrients and contaminants in the water, meaning that when you have storm flow coming in, it's going to displace this you know, contaminated water, and the water that's leaving the pond is actually uh, quite problematic. So we're trying to understand uh, why that's happening, what to do about it, and what some of our options are. So I can't go into all of that research in this brief talk today, but I'm happy to share the other paper we've published uh, that goes into more detail. Um, so what some of the options that we've been looking at, which are uh, quite popular in, in lake management, uh, different watershed-based methods of changing the amount of uh, pollutants that are coming into your pond, uh, chemical treatment of the sediments. So how can we keep the phosphorus down in the sediments instead of in the water? Mechanical aeration. If we can artificially mix the pond, maybe we can promote oxic conditions uh, where the phosphorus will stay put in the sediments. Uh, bath bathymetry modifications. Can we change the shape of the pond to make it work better? Uh, reorientations of the outlet works. If we can have the water leaving the pond at a different point, would that make a difference? Um, some of these uh, pond side solutions like iron in hand sand filter bench, and then uh, wind sheltering reduction. If we can do something about the vegetation around the pond, would that have an impact? So we had quite a few different scenarios we wanted to evaluate. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to focus on these three that I felt like were the most interesting um, for this talk, but I'm happy to take questions on the others. Uh, so for this model, we were using uh, C equal W2, which is, uh, I'm sure many folks at SAFL are familiar with, was developed by the US Army Corps of Engineers for lakes and reservoir modeling, uh, but has been used since then um, in estuaries, wetlands, rivers, and even ponds. So it's quite a, quite a robust model. Uh, for our purposes, we took four stormwater ponds here in the Twin Cities Metro. We tried to get a big range of sizes, water quality, age, shape, um, to, to compare them. And the one of the scenarios that we were looking at first was uh, chemical treatment of the sediments. So what this is representing would be uh, in lake applications, you see these large barges that people will take around and release an aluminum compound that can bind the phosphorus to the sediments in a form that they will be permanently trapped there. Um, and on the lower two pictures, you can see uh, some new technologies that are being pioneered here in Minnesota by local firms where they can have a smaller scale application that's more suited to a stormwater pond. So the way we assess these, um, First, we looked at our four different ponds. We had our original scenario of how we believe them to be performing 
uh, presently. Um, and we created a scenario under which we've applied this alum or some similar uh, sediment treatment, and then a hypothetical no release scenario of what if we could 100% treat the pond, knowing full well that that likely isn't cost effective in real life. Um, so in order to inform those, uh, we had in the prior study collected uh, sediment cores from these ponds so we could measure the release rate of phosphorus from those sediments. Uh, through the literature and experience from local consulting firms, we were able to calculate what would approximately be the reduction that we could expect if we applied alum in these ponds. Um, and similarly, we were able to get some extensive cost information to be able to approximate what would it cost to do an alum application in one of these ponds. Um, so as a, as a side note, oops, it's quite loud. So as a side note, uh, this is another alternative to alum that we were also interested in. It's being explored by uh, Dr. Gulliver and Purnima Natarajan primarily, uh, looking at iron filings as a, as a particulate solid form uh, chemical treatment that you could put on a pond, which would allow you to apply it over the winter ice, and we're hoping would be a, even more cost effective than alum. So the output of the model, so basically taking the same pond scenarios for these different ponds and just changing how much phosphorus sediment release is going to be happening, we can see that uh, with the different scenarios, we have reductions in phosphorus export from the pond here on the left-hand plots. Uh, but we see that the behavior is quite different on some of these other ponds. So the Langton and Minnetonka ponds, for one reason or another, are not exploiting that, that much phosphorus to begin with, so there's not much reduction to happen. In the Langton pond, this is because it's a fairly new pond, so there isn't much phosphorus being released from the sediment, just not enough has accumulated yet. Uh, in the Minnetonka pond, which is much older, is just a, a factor of the hydrology of the pond. There isn't much water that leaves the pond at all, so there isn't much phosphorus that can leave. It just stays put and concentrates. So when we look at the concentrations of phosphorus in the pond, if we're interested in treating this pond to have it be an aesthetic amenity for a community, for example, uh, then we worry about the concentration in the pond in addition to what's being exported. Um, and we see that there are reductions throughout uh, the Langton pond. There's not much we can reduce because there's not much phosphorus in it. But in the Minnetonka pond, even though it's not exporting any, we can reduce the, the concentrations in the pond. And we go into much more detail, uh, some research that was published by Ben Jenke goes into much more detail about this balance between uh, the hydrology and the water quality. So I see that time is getting away from me. So I will jump ahead uh, to where I look at these results together. So basically, after we've done these simulations, we've looked at the different uh, uh, scenarios, the different remediation strategies, uh, in order to compare them, we wanted to evaluate not just the effectiveness, but the cost effectiveness. So what I'm showing here on the plot, across the top, we have each of our ponds, and we look at them both for total phosphorus export and total phosphorus concentration. And then going vertically down, we have our different scenarios. And for a pond to have the red X, that means that it was not a, an effective treatment. We did not greatly reduce the total phosphorus export or the total phosphorus concentration. Uh, for the orange check, that's the, it was effective at reducing phosphorus, but it was quite expensive relative to the amount of phosphorus that was reduced. So it's probably not a cost-effective treatment that you would actually try. Um, but then the green one, it was cost-effective. So it, we recommend that you try it. And you can see that it is quite varied for each pond some scenarios are much more attractive uh, than others. Some are more likely to be effective. And it also changes whether you are trying to treat the pond itself for water quality, or if you're trying to protect something downstream uh, and protect and treat the pond for that. So there's a, a lot of lessons to come out of this study, but there's a lot of more, more work we would like to do. But we hope that it's a starting point for consideration when folks are trying to protect their lakes and ponds. Uh, that they really consider the details behind their goals and what approaches might be suitable rather than looking for a one size fits all solution. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you all very much. Thank you, Vinny. Really nice work. And congratulations on this uh, um, award. And uh, well, okay, typically, okay, if everything is on in person, 
then I, at this moment, I would give you a certificate and together with a check. <laughs> but since now you are living in North Carolina, then we can only do it virtually. So I will make sure you will receive the certificate and the check for this for the really nice work. Congratulations. And we uh, can have uh, a couple of minutes for a few quick questions. I'm wondering from the audience if anyone has any questions. And also, you know, from the audience, one can uh, type in the question in the, in the chat box. Yeah. And uh, well, while we are waiting for that, and uh, Finny, okay, let me um, ask you something about what you showed uh, in one of the tables, uh, you know, towards the end. You mentioned that there are different mechanisms, different ways. And one of them is about uh, um, uh, mechanical aeration, and another one is about the wind shear, uh, about the wind effect. Could you elaborate on these two things or, okay, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, sorry, I didn't have time to, to go into more detail, but um, basically the mechanical aeration, our goal would be to um, artificially mix the pond. So we would have some kind of bubble plume um, to, to break up the thermal stratification that's quite that develops quite strongly in these ponds over the summer. So as a way to get atmospheric oxygen back down to the bottom. Um, so yeah, we did some calculations on how you would size the system appropriately for these ponds, what that would cost, um, and then simulated in the model um, if we had uh, if sorry uh, if if we had that uh, kind of oxygen exposure to reduce the the sediments, how would that compare uh, to the chemical treatments? Uh, for wind sheltering reduction, we were noticing that many of the ponds that we go to have quite mature vegetation around, especially if they were built, you know, 40 or so years ago. And anecdotally, it seemed like these ponds were the greenest ones. So we've been collecting a lot of data. Uh, Jacques Finlay and Ben Janke have really been uh, the, the main people behind that effort. But we're trying to understand more at what point does, a pond, does something become problematic for these ponds. Um, so Bill Herb did some nice uh, 3D computational fluid dynamic modeling for us, looking at the wind sheltering in each of these ponds, taking into account buildings, topography, vegetation. And then um, we did some scenario modeling where we can see well, the wind flowing for each direction. If we reduce the vegetation by a certain percentage, what would that cost and what kind of wind exposure we would get? Um, surprisingly, we found that that actually didn't improve the water quality so much. Uh, and that, that was strange to us because you're, redu you're removing all of the trees. We saw a reduction in the wind sheltering coefficient. It seemed like it would make a big improvement. Um, but I, I've noticed uh, out in the field, even some ponds that don't have any trees around them, it's all grass, uh, just the bank slope. Uh, here comparing a narrow part of the pond to the much wider part of the pond uh, has a huge difference in the uh, amount of wind sheltering that impacts the water surface. So I, I think that's a, a big factor we're still trying to explore. I see, I see. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, anyone else uh, wants to ask the questions? Oh. I'll ask a question. Okay, hi, Xiaoting, go ahead. Hi, Vini. Um, thank you for the presentation. I was just wondering, um, have any of the managers of these pods adopted some of the findings and how, like, how did it respond to what you found with different treatment? methods? Yeah, great question. Um, I think John and Jacques might know better than I do since I'm not living in Minnesota anymore. Um, but from the from the presentations I gave, it seems like folks were very interested in this. They, they appreciated being able to compare some of the different options uh, because usually everything seems good on paper and you don't really know which would be the most appropriate. Um, we have been working with some ponds that or some pond managers who are interested in trying some of the solutions, particularly the iron filings and alum that seem to be pretty cost effective. Um, some folks are interested in some of the other things like watershed management and tree removal, uh, but that seems to to fit better into larger time scales like water, watershed management plans rather than pond by pond treatments. Um, John and Jacques, please feel free to add anything if if you feel like a it would fit. 
That's great, Vinny. I think I think there's growing interest in trying to do something to improve these ponds, but we're really at the early stages of uh, developing uh, good guidance. So it one thing we've learned from our work in street sweeping is that it takes a long time for this information to propagate, and um, so it's it's part of a uh, what will be a long process. Great. Well, um, for the interest of time, um, I would like to move on to the next part of the uh, program. And uh, well, uh, congratulations to Vinny again. And also I want to thank uh, Professor John Gallifer and uh, Professor Shark Finley as the co-advisors to Vinny okay, for uh, this great work. And lastly, of course, okay, thanks to Roger and Jane okay, for the, all your service, all your contributions to the lab. And I very much look forward to the third aunt fellowship ceremony next year. All right. okay. So for the next part of the program, and as many in the audience know, for SAFO award ceremony, we always um, invite a distinguished speaker and to give a keynote talk. And this year, I'm extremely excited to introduce the speaker, Professor George Kanidakis from Brown University. And the Professor Kanidakis, he is originally for, from Crete in, in Greece, and uh, he got his uh, PhD degree from MIT. And after that, he, uh, after short uh, um, appointments at uh, uh, MIT and Stanford, then he went to Princeton to be a faculty member there for many years. And later he went to Brown University and then he, he stayed there he, for the past few <laughs> couple of decades. And the Professor uh, Kanidakis is a very well is, uh, <laughs> accomplished uh, <laughs> scientist and his uh, impact uh, in research is significant in many different areas. Yeah. And uh, he has uh, many uh, honors <laughs> and uh, he basically is a fellow of uh, all kinds of uh, professional societies <laughs> that I'm aware of. And uh, he has a long list of awards. If I need to read them, then that will take me a few minutes. <laughs> so I just want to mention that uh, he is a member of uh, National Academy of uh, Engineering and uh, he is a Fanna Bush faculty fellow. So that he, uh, those are great, great honors. And uh, um, he has published extensively, and, uh, Professor Kalinakis, he has wrote five books and uh, a large number, numerous papers. And uh, so, <laughs> and how many of them? Actually, I really don't know because it's hard for me to count because different from <laughs> many of us who list the papers on the CVs, the CV I found online uh, from Professor George Kanidakis is he actually listed his papers under different categories. And for each different categories, like fluid mechanics or paracomputing or machine learning, then there are like 100 papers below it. <laughs> okay. So his impact is huge. And um, um, in terms of numbers, and I need to be very careful about those numbers, his age impact, uh, impact factor is 123, and the citation is more than $70,000. And the reason I want, I said I need to be very careful, careful, careful about the numbers is because each numbers is growing. <laughs> so okay, okay. So so if the information is a little bit outdated, that's my fault. Okay, yeah. So um, today, okay, Professor Kanidakis is going to in, uh, introduce uh, about his recent work on. Physics informed the deep learning, and uh, that is about blending data and physics for faster predictions using scientific computing. So, without uh, much ado, then I will turn this uh, screen to Professor Kanidakis. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lian. Uh, the, um, I'm very honored to be here. I know Roger for a long time. Uh, I graduate exactly 20 years after him from MIT, from the other department next to him. But uh, I, I want to tell a story before I uh, start uh, 
uh, of um, how uh, Roger helped the younger people. It was uh, almost um, 20 years ago when I was um, trying to uh, have this idea of suppressing turbulence and uh, using traveling waves. And nobody would believe me. And uh, all my proposals, and I know lots of young assistant professors would, uh, would find comfort in that. Uh, I was, uh, all new ideas are rejected at first. And then one time I met uh, Roger, I think he was at that time at the NSF, and uh, I was talking maybe at the APS meeting with him and uh, about uh, how I can use traveling waves to, to suppress turbulence, something that uh, others did not believe he believed. He said, George, I will, uh, I'm will. i now an NSF director. I will give you $50,000 seed funding to, um, to do this and check it. And indeed, I did. We published a paper in Science. I think that was 2002 or 2003, I think. It was the first paper on, on DNS, on turbulence in, in science. And uh, unfortunately, he moved on. So when I was ready to write my proposal, I submitted to NSF. It was rejected again. <laughs> but uh, but I have to say several people around the world picked up this idea and actually built experiments and so on. So uh, now I have a similar story here. What I, I first of all I wanted to treat uh, Roger with some coffee here. It's an espresso. I like espresso. I think he likes espresso too. So one of my curiosities, and I, I like fundamental fluid mechanics. Uh, Leanne knows uh, is um, wh what is going on over the espresso cap? What's the fluid mechanics of that? What's the 3D velocity field would look like? And, uh, and, and what's the pressure field in 3D and time? And so we have, obviously that's a, uh, this is a proposal that was rejected many times. Nobody wanted to fund this, but finally I convinced this company La Vision, which is a big visualization company. You may have their software in the laboratory. Uh, to actually do these experiments, as you can see here on the right, there's a bunch of cameras, and they were able to capture the uh, what I show here is just one slice, but they did slice by slice. They could get a volumetric plume of uh, of the um, thermal gradients, basically, but that the Slirian photography would give you that. It's an old technique used in aerodynamics in the 60s a lot in black and white. Now we have it in color. So the question is, okay, if I do that and I just have this video, can we turn this qualitative information to quantitative information? So we have velocity and pressure. So I know now you say that's not important problem. That's why your proposal was rejected. I always wanted to know how fast the aroma of the coffee will reach my nose. That's of course not such a technological problem, but important, but it underlines the uh, ill posedness that we cannot deal with uh, computationally. So we have beautiful visualizations in fluid mechanics, a kaleidoscope of interesting phenomena, but we don't really turn that into a quantitative info information, forces, stresses, and so on. So I'm gonna show you today that this is now possible. It's enabled by physics-informed machine learning. Uh, now here's another question, maybe uh, more fundamental and for te in textbooks. Um, we published also this in science, and uh, and this was um, we asked the question: Can you extract quantitative information from flow visualizations? Like in every textbook, or you will see this flow around a cylinder, the von Karman street. If you have these beautiful visualizations, how how can you go beyond admiration and actually compute the forces, the lift, and the drag? Is that possible? And I will answer that question later. Clearly, with current technology, you cannot do that. It's an ill-posed problem. You don't know even the Reynolds number. You don't know the um, uh, uh, the incoming flow and so on. Here's a more pragmatic, everyday problem. A neurosurgeon like my my uh, collaborator Joseph Marston from Ch Boston Children's Hospital uh, will see something like this before he operates someone with a brain aneurysm. So you see this dilation here uh, on the right. This is something that uh, you don't want in your brain arteries. But uh, what they put is they, they put this contrasting agent. They have this visualization. Uh, you know, we are fluid mechanicians. We know that there's a vortex here and so on. There's, but the question is, when do, do brain ruptures, uh, do aneurysm rupture? At what point? And, and, and so the, the current state of the art is the doctor will look at the size and say, okay, 
uh, let's not let's do anything yet. And that's very, very dangerous. So, so the question is, can you can can this information provide quantitative information? Just this black and white video. Um, it's not so trivial to obtain, uh, but it is a routine uh, procedure now can inform the doctor, the neurosurgeon quantitatively. That's very important, more important, I think, that my espresso coffee question. So let me, uh, not everybody is into deep learning. And so I have a little glossary by the way of an outline to show that uh, when we talk about supervised learning means that we have lots of data, pair data, input outputs. So a neural network will be a function that will basically uh, regress this data and will map the input data to the to the output data. In the process, by doing that many times, we will learn the function. The unsupervised learning is, is a little different. We don't have labeled data. We don't have outcomes. So you can think of proper orthogonal decomposition or principal component analysis that we use a lot in fluid mechanics for classification purposes, for pattern patterns, identification, and so on. That is an unsupervised learning. And then something that is actually extremely useful uh, uh, for, for fluid mechanics, for controlling processes, transport processes, is this reinforcement learning, which is basically an interaction, it's an optimization method. Uh, uh, this schematic probably reveals what is going on. You're trying to have to, to, to interact with the environment for a certain action, and you have a reward for that action, and you have a very complicated tasks going through this maze, for example, so you can adjust the reward so that action is taking. So it's a very dynamic process, so dynamic flow control would be appropriate for that. Uh, now, you think that this is new stuff, Very everybody's very excited about machine learning and so on, but actually this, this is not true. This is mathematics that was developed 50 years ago by Bellman uh, at, at, at the Bell Labs, uh, a fixed point iteration that people are now um, uh, use, use it uh, without really acknowledging the, the original uh, creators of this or fundamental mathematics. But that's another story. I want to uh, show you how we can actually use this in uh, reinforcement learning in um, for flow control and experiments. And I go back to uh, the classical flow past the cylinder, which I show you. And uh, years ago, I think it was in the uh, late 80s or early 90s, early 90s maybe, Professor Srinivasan Srini, who was at Yale University at the time, published a nice paper with one of his students uh, who um, is in the faculty, I think, in, in uh, Minnesota. I forgot his name now, but um, I, I follow their work very closely at that time. Uh, so this was sort of, sort of suppressing the vortex street using these control uh, cylinders, very small cylinders, the wake, uh, uh, cr creating uh, count, uh, counteractive vortices, which will then affect also the vortex street. So uh, it takes a lot of work and so on, but we, since we know the answer, we wanted to know if reinforcement learning can actually learn this mechanism, this controlling mechanism, without you know, fine tuning the, the rotations, the position and so on. So we built this um, uh, with my colleague, uh, Michael Triandafilu and his uh, PhD student, Disha Fan, Disha Fan, who uh, uh, later on, he got a, an award like you gave to, today to Vinny. Uh, on for this for his thesis, so we one of my students helped him to program uh, this uh, this device, and um, and they, it turns out so we did this uh, in the so-called MIT Intelligent Towing Tank that it does its own experiments twenty four seven. We had a paper on science robotics on this, but uh, uh, back to the to the physics. It turns out that this is the you can do this experiment very quickly. This is physics agnostic. Uh, just by feeding the data into into this reinforcement learning algorithm, uh, you can see here on the on the top. These are actually experimental results. What you see here on the left is simulations, but we did these simulations much later. So five to ten minutes into the uh, experiment, or much earlier actually, depends on the on exactly what objective we have. Uh, the uh, the optimization algorithm is learned on the fly. And then what you see here on the bottom is uh, the controls, the, the two controls on the cylinder. Eventually, you can see that it finds the right way. The, go, the lift goes to zero. The drag is minimized. And we have basically destroyed this very strong structure, which is a three-dimensional vortex street. So that take, takes about 10 minutes in the laboratory after you build it. But it took uh, about a month to do the simulations to, 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 to get into the details and more understanding 
Uh, but, but the point is that reinforcement learning is an effective algorithm that can be used. So I'm not going to talk about that. That's a physics agnostic algorithm. I'm going to talk about physics informed algorithms that could also be used in experiments. I'll talk a lot about experiments, although I never did one in my life. So let me start with a little math uh, just to remind or to inform people that the neural network is not the device. It's actually a function. It's an interpolator. So the first work was done by George Saipenko at Tufts University when he was assistant professor. And he basically proved that a very simple construction, what we call now a single hidden layer. Here's an input, here's an output. We're trying to approximate a function with these neurons. These neurons you can think of as independent degrees of freedom. And basically, uh, he, you create a basis, a basis like that, where we have weights, Ws are the weights, Think of weights as a non coefficients. X is the input, Y is the output. Sigma is some ad hoc nonlinear function, which could be a sigmoid. It has to have some mathematical properties, but it cannot be a polynomial. So today, for example, we use hyperbolic tangents, um, ram functions, and, and, and all sorts of signs. You can use signs, cosines, but not polynomials. Anyway, it turns out that you can write a, a series like that, just like a Fourier series. This will be a nonlinear basis corresponding to the number n of the neurons. And as you increase the number of n, he proved mathematically and rigorously that indeed this simple single layer neural network can approximate with arbitrary accuracy epsilon this function y. Okay. So now, the, of course, the question then becomes how do you learn these w's, the weights, and the bias? So there's the bias. But that's all you need. The unknowns here is the Ws and the bias, so the matrix of weights and the vector of unknowns. So you need lots of data, of course, to, to do that. But before I, I get to, to the data point, to the, to the point about data, I want to, to, to show you what, what today we're using a sort of a deeper implementation of this layer to have multiple hidden layers so that this, non, this initial nonlinearity is amplified uh, where uh, you can see connections, there are different connections, not so important really. But at the end, we have this linear layer. At the very end, we don't actually use a activation function, which we denoted by sigma before. Uh, so, so what you can write this in terms of the functions that you produce in the previous layer. And now the neural network is nothing else but a linear combination of these weights, which are just the unknown coefficients, times a basis. And you can think this, of this as a finite element basis except you don't know it explicitly. This, this basis is computed on the fly automatically based on the data and the correlation between input and output. So in summary, what I'm trying to tell you is that a neural network, uh, let's demystify it, is nothing else but something that we actually know very well. It's a linear combination of, of uh, some nonlinear basis. And these are the unknown coefficients that we, we're trying to find. Now. If you have a lot of data, as I said, you can find all these ways, you can find this basis, but this basis is now adaptive basis. So for example, let's try to apply this to this function here with two neural, two, neural, two layers. So the function itself has a discontinuity, could be a shock, have low frequency on the right, high frequency. I, I construct this, this uh, function itself in order to go inside the neural network and take a Fourier transform as the neural network is learning the function to see what's going on. So it's not dissimilar to what we do with Fourier expansions where we learn from low frequencies to high frequencies. But as you, as you see, or you will see again in the uh, animation, uh, the first thing that this neural network does, which is the red line, it attacks the discontinuity, something that uh, uh, Fourier functions will not do. Then it goes to the low frequency and the high frequency, what's called as the um, uh, spectral bias. And if you look at the spectrum here, the, the, the high frequencies, the energetic frequencies are, con are all corrected. And then you can see here that the very long tail that is associated with this one point that goes back to the shock after the high frequency to, to correct actually the construction. Uh, and, and, that, and that's this very long tail in the spectrum. So why I'm telling you this, since you are interested in fluid mechanics, and but some of you are computing. Well, the reason I'm saying that is, is to first show that neural networks are not dissimilar from other numerical methods, but they also have an advantage in the sense that they are adapting according to the data that we try to fit. 
without changing grids. And, and we'll talk about removing this tyranny of, of grids and biases and so on using this new generation of methods. So this brings me to what I want to talk about today, which is primarily this scenario here in the middle where in fluid mechanics and not in many disciplines, but in, 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 in certainly in multi-physics, when we have reactive transport, like in the talk that Vinnie gave before, uh, you probably can write down equations for advection and diffusion, but you never know the reactions. The reactions are never known, non-equilibrium. Uh, so, so you, but you have some data. So how can we combine this data and, and the physics? Now, people from geophysics will, will say, well, we've been doing that for many, many years and those who are doing weather. Yes, there are many data simulation methods. Uh, however, those methods are very expensive, uh, inadequate and have not really um, uh, done justice to the real data. Uh, every time there's noisy data, uh, you have to change method. Every time you, you solve for one more parameter, you have to change method. We're trying to, to um, abandon that, but this is the scenario that I'm operating, uh, that we have some data and some physics. There are, of course, cases where we have no physics at all, but you have lots of data. And this is scenario on the left is where we've been doing so far in, in computational fluid dynamics, where we have we pretend we know all the physics and we just need to boundary conditions to solve the problem. And that's not, that's not true at all. Uh, that, that's, that's for classroom exercises, not the real world, not in the laboratory in the field experiment. So this brings me to this paper. Uh, I talked about our proposals were rejected. This paper was rejected a uh, couple of times before it was uh, published. Finally, now it's the most downloaded paper. We get the citation every 20 minutes. And the reason was rejected because they said this is trying to integrate data and physics that has been done before. And it's really simple. Why is it so simple? It's so simple because we want it to be so simple. And we want it to simplify things so that a high school student can do this. So let me explain what is a PIN, a physics informed neural network. And I'll start from the left here. I hope you can see my pen, the red pen that I write. So that's basically a standard neural network. We have an input X and T. We're trying to find u, which is a function of xt. That's a neural network. U, uh, the neural network will represent this time-dependent 1D function, which happened to be also a solution to a parameterized Schrodinger equation, which I have here. Now, the neural network is this. So in order to find these connections, which is basically uh, thousands of weights and biases, the w's that I talked about, sigma here is the activation function, you, what you have to do is to provide a lot of measurements. You have to have 10,000 measurements or 1,000 measurements and so on. But we don't have that many measurements in real life, in science, in engineering, in fluid mechanics. And we have sporadic measurements, and the measurements are not exactly where we want them, on the boundaries. What we have instead is our conservation laws. And the conservation laws don't have to be parameterized. That's why I parameterize here the Schrodinger equation with lambda 1 and lambda 2. But but we know that we need to satisfy this equation. F here has to be zero. If we now, with just that realization then gives you this idea of generating new data using conservation laws, using the laws of mass, momentum, transport, and so on. So um, then, now how you incorporate? How you encode that into a neural network? Uh, well, the first one, the mathematics of neural networks is extremely boring and simple, actually. I'm an applied math professor, so, so sometimes I'm embarrassed to even talk about it. Uh, but, but here is a list squares that fits this data. So this is a given data, and this is like the, 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 I, I talk about data and physics, and these are the predictions, and this is the number of data points that you have. As I said, NU, the number of data points is not a lot, so I need more. So how do I generate a lot? By this trying to satisfy also the um, residual f to be zero. F think of this as a residual. So by insisting that f has to be zero on the random points in the domain in space time, then you come up with a optimization problem where the mean square error, you can, you can use other norms. We have the data here and we have the physics. And of course we can weight those. We can weight uh, the data and weight the physics. But now the way, I formulate the problem, I have created a huge simplification is because I can put the weights here 
lambda of one and lambda two in front of the data and the weights. And I can, if, if for example, if lambda one is zero, I have only the physics, which is basically the standard forward problem we, we will always solve in, in CFD, in computational fluid dynamics. If I, if I have lambda, if I have lambda one, let's say 0.5 and lambda two is 0.5, I have an equal balance of data and, and, uh, and physics and so on. And by using, by minimizing this, you can also find, turns out you can also find as hyperparameters lambda one and lambda two. You can then obtain everything you know you need to know about the, the physics uh, and, and therefore solve this equation that obeys this data. Now, where is the simplification? The simplification is that in order to have to solve this equation here, we use a technology that was developed by Google and others on uh, automatic differentiation. How do you take this? these operators, the Laplacians, the advection, the kernel for vorticity and so on. We use automatic differentiation, the same technology that is used to back propagate the error in commercial machine learning. So we use the same to build this operator. And so essentially what we do, we extend the neural network to include the physics because we use the same parameter space. Okay, so this will become, I think, clear here. So let's look at the Berges equation, of course, the Berges equation was uh, developed by Berges for turbulence uh, in, in, in Holland years ago. So how we solve this? Well, first of all, unlike other methods, we never discretize space and time. Space and time, X and T are continuous variables. Do we have data? Well, you may have some data. For example, you have initial conditions here with the black crosses. You may have boundary conditions at X minus one and X plus one, but notice here, you don't have boundary conditions for a long period of time. So that alone is enough so that you're, don't, you're not able to, to prevent you from solving this equation using standard solvers. However, in other words, the nil pose problem. However, here, the way we formulate the problem, we're looking at an optimization problem and a minimization problem. This is not in the lack sense, a well-posed or not well-posed problem. So even if I don't have boundary conditions, I can solve this problem. So this, this black point will go into here. Uh, the neural network takes only one line of code to, uh, to do this, define the neural network. It takes a couple of lines of code to take derivatives. Notice that TF gradient takes the derivatives because I told you to do automatic differentiation. Totally, we remove the grid. We don't use grids. We evaluate the physics in some random points by doing sampling, like Monte Carlo sampling, in random points inside the domain, as I show here with my red pen. 10 minutes later, after you do that, you get pretty good looking solutions that in the class it takes about six months to show students how to do that. And, and these solutions, as you can see, there's no overshoots, undershoots, there's no Gibbs phenomena that we spend a lot of time talking about. And now you know why, because this basis adapts to the solution on the fly. Now, I said it's very simple. In fact, recently, we published a paper with Jeremy Yu. Jeremy Yu is a high school student. Uh, he was a high school student. He's now a first year uh, college student, but in, uh, in Texas, in St. Mark's uh, school, where I invite him to give a talk to my group. We have a seminar on uh, ma machine learning plus applications. And uh, he's, as I said, just before his English class, he's, uh, he took some time to give, uh, to give a lecture to my, to my group at Brown University, and he developed something new. He said, why don't you just, in addition to this, why don't you add the gradient of the residual? Because if you have the gradient of the residual, you can have smoothness and you can do it faster and so on. So this is a 17 year old, he wrote codes. We wrote as a paper, 40 pages paper is published. And basically what he showed is that the old pin method is this here, the error versus the number of training points. In his, when you include a gradient of pins, what you call G pins, you get a much faster, faster with very few points. Remember, these these points are your measurements. You don't want to to have to rely on lots of points. So very few points. You can train. You can basically solve this diffusion reaction equation. And he knew about Alan Kahn. He knew the calculus and so on. So he, he was not your ordinary high school student. He's now a first year MIT student. But but yes, he succeeded to humiliate my postdocs because. He basically beat, beat us from the original paper by a huge factor by having a good idea that he implemented as a high school student. There's other ideas here, how you can extend this to, 
multiple domains, for example, for the same Berger's equation, you can have a domain one, the dolphin, a domain two, arbitrary domains. You can have two neural networks working together. We call that the X pin, extended pin. So you can do that twice as fast. You can do a hundred times faster and so on and so forth. You have to glue these domains together, but you know that the residual is zero. Um, how does this apply to Navier-Stokes? Well, it's very, very simple, actually. Uh, and you can see here the Navier-Stokes equations could be in the velocity pressure. It could be in uh, vorticity formulation. You simply encode these equations. You find the residuals of the momentum and the uh, here the divergence, the constraint, and you just penalize. You put all this and you penalize it in the loss function. The loss function, what I, it's this mean square error. And so you basically penalize the squares of all these residuals. And if you have data, like the boundary conditions, inside the domain or outside domain or at any sporadic point, you can include this data here, okay? Uh, so uh, here's an example from Kovasne, one of the great of Johns Hopkins University, who actually back in the, in the 40s, he derived an exact solution. Uh, that's not so important. The important thing is that it's in this domain in order to solve this with CFD, you need to know boundary conditions on all boundaries. In this table here, I show that in this case, in one, we know all the boundary conditions. So we can get a very small error 0 0.008. Now here, I don't know boundary conditions on the sides and the error is still 0.05. Here, I don't know boundary conditions on the side and the outflow. The error is still down to 3%. And the point is none of these cases we can solve with CFD. Doesn't matter how much you pay for your CFD package. It cannot be solved here. We can solve it from with errors from 0 0.01 to 5% at maximum without any boundary conditions. So that's sort of the, the game changer here because we don't always know our boundary conditions. So that takes me back to what I call hidden fluid mechanics, the paper we published also in science a couple of years ago. And, and let's go back to flow past the cylinder. I challenged my postdoc. I said, okay, if you're looking downstream of an object, like a bluff object, and you have a flow visualization in an arbitrary domain, like they cut out a flower, let's say, and you have a video of that. Can you extract quantitative information for the pressure and the velocity field? You don't know the Reynolds number. You don't know, you just know the medium and you don't have any, any, any other conditions. So the answer is yes. We can actually hardwire here into the neural network, the equations we believe govern this flow. Uh, in this case, the Navier, incompressible Navier-Stokes equations. And then the data here, what's the data is on this passive scalar. And we don't know the Peclet number, but the Peclet number is just one more parameter to find from the richness of the information in this video. And, and also, uh, we, we may need the, the diffusion uh, coefficient, for example, or something like that. But we know the medium. So anyway, if we match the, the, this, this, the, the outcome of this equation from the neural network to the real data, then in the process, we learn the velocity and we also learn the pressure. We learn, in other words, if we do a CFD computation independently and we pretend we didn't use any of the CFD simulation, we can match the data. Going, talking about the forces, if you have the die going around the body, you can see we can also compute the forces. This, this is shown here more accurate where one of the reviewers asked, can you do like the strict lines? Like we have smoke visualization. Can you extract the forces from pictures like this, which uh, like this picture here is the album of motion, fluid motion in uh, Milton Van Dyke's uh, great book. Uh, uh, so, so the answer is yes, you can actually use that information as particle tracking. That goes information that you try to match from a neural network. And you can see you can produce the, the lift coefficient and the, and the drag coefficient within one to 5% accuracy, depending on, on the specifics of what you, what, how much noise and so on. Uh, these pins also can be used to track transition from a laminar flow to a turbulent flow. This is work we did with um, Charles Menevo and Tamer Zaki at Johns Hopkins. We never published this work. Uh, it can be used also for very practical applications, for example, rescue operations, the same idea uh, in uh, the Gulf of Mexico. Here we're looking at this area called laser. And the idea is that you, can, you have a, a lot of data from satellites, multiple satellites now, on the surface, sea surface temperature. So the question that I pose is, can you obtain the ocean currents, which is very, very difficult measurement, 
everywhere in the ocean where you can have, let's say, a, uh, a movie or uh, from, from the satellites of the sea surface temperature. Just from the sea surface temperature, can you derive, um, can you infer the ocean currents? And the answer is yes. Here we use the real data, but we also use the ROMs, this ocean model that has the temperature, assimilated temperature. This is what the ocean model does. This is the estimated flow field. Of course, this takes uh, zero time to, to obtain after you train the network. So it's a very useful thing. You can see also how oil spills are pro propagate and so on. So, so this is uh, uh, now uh, more useful. Let's go back to my collaborator, Joe Mashten, when he's looking at this picture, can he extract quantitative information? Again, the idea is to do it creatively, take this black and white and assign it to some advection equation. You can add diffusion if you like. Then you try to minimize this. Then you couple this to the physics. Notice here we use a non-Newtonian fluid. So model specification is up to you, for example. And then we impose also incompressibility for homogenized blood. And then we train this network with just a video. In fact, we train only, we don't need to have, if we do this as a CFD simulation, first of all, we cannot do it because it's the inverse problem, it's very difficult. But here we can, we can only focus on the aneurysmal sac, not the entire artery, make it faster. And you can see here that we actually infer the uh, hidden physics uh, and uh, in and, and the process, if I get the wall shear, I can get the wall shear stress and the pressure, I can get the forces. So this is, if I were to solve a CFD problem forward, this is what I would get. Uh, but uh, this is what we discover without actually knowing what's going on elsewhere. We don't even know the, the boundary condition. So, so it is possible. Going back to my coffee example, uh, it is exactly that same problem because what La Vision gives me is Slidon photographies here on the left. Through neural network, I match them, and then I infer in the process the pressure and the velocity. Uh, and I have now a 3D velocity field and, uh, and, and the pressure. And this was published, uh, believe it or not, in, finally in Journal Fluid Mechanics. <laughs> and, and in order for us to do that, they had to go back, La Vision had to go back and, and do a PIV experiment in addition to the Slidon photography because they didn't believe, like I didn't actually believe myself, that the maximum velocity uh, in here is 0.4 meters per second, uh, which means that the aroma of the coffee comes really fast towards you. Anyway, why La Vision funded us, just like why Roger funded us? Roger at the time uh, took a chance on us and, and, uh, and say, okay, have some money here for seed funding. You can use it. Uh, this is Thomas Berg, my collaborator who um, in the beginning of the pandemic, he posted this on a YouTube video. So I asked my, uh, I was very impressed uh, from the flow visualizations, the Slidon photography again, but I said to my postdoc, can you actually quantify this using, using a neural network? So, so he took a smaller domain and he was able to do this hidden fluid mechanics where this is like a passive scalar and then he could get the with and without uh, the mask, the pressure, and the velocity um, around around him in a very quantitative form. Then they believe us. Then they they uh, uh, they decide to do this extra experiment for us for COVID, so that my curiosity is resolved. Now this same idea could be very useful in many um, cases where you have some marker like some tracer. Um, here we um, apply to a uh, uh, retinal. Uh, uh, micro, uh, diabetic retinopathy for uh, people who have diabetes type 1 or type 2, they develop these little dots in, uh, in, in, on their eyes, which now we have uh, some uh, smart optics techniques that we can visualize their geometry. And basically, there, these are microaneurysms, just like the big aneurysm I show you, these are microaneurysms, which, which could uh, rupture at any time and therefore uh, it could cause uh, blindness eventually uh, to, um, to diabetic uh, patients. So, uh, so we did this experiment with my collaborator, uh, Ming Dao from MIT and my long-term collaborator, Subra Suresh, who is president of, he was at MIT now, he's president in Singapore of a university there, but he's still writing papers with us. So basically they took a different size of, uh, you can see microfluidics here, 
different sizes, different uh, orientations, and so on. Of, uh, and they did this beautiful experiment trying to see what's the fluid mechanics there and so on. And that's great. And for those of you who have doing microfluidic experiments, I, I love microfluidics myself. But if you think about how much information is lost, here we are interested actually in the wall shear stress of the fluid at the wall, but we just have a nice visualization. Can we extract the, the answer is you cannot because the PIV, for example, whatever these are, this is the red blood cells that you visualize, it's very opaque, but you cannot get anything very close to the wall. However, we can use the method I told you, the neural networks, what we call artificial velo image velocimetry, similar ideas before, we take the image, we encode it. That's like a passive scalar. We have some non-Newtonian fluid mechanics here. We encode it. And, um, and then we can extract the entire quantitative field, velocity and pressure. And you can see, for example, here, when I cut through here, I get these points, which are very important. That's, it. That's how I can compute the wall shear stress compared to other methods, state of the art of optical flow and, and some other methods that appear. In the literature, they cannot very, go very close to the wall. Because we use the physics, we can actually get also the physics of the wall. In fact, you can go from 2D slices to a 3D slice. And I have this now for the microaneurysm. We have an, another paper with some uh, neuroscientists where, we, for the first time, we have been able to measure the velocity and the pressure inside the mouse of a live, uh, of, a, of a, uh, uh, the head of a live mouse. I wanted to show you some more uh, beautiful fluid mechanics. This uh, also goes back to LaVision. The state of the art of LaVision is, uh, is this shake the box, some Lagrangian particle tracking at uh, high particle image uh, densities. So they, in, in this uh, case, they have a 3D turbulent jet. You can see the particles here, and lots of particles. Uh, and this is what they get. This is the visualizations they get. You can see they have closed structure, a 2D view, the 3D view, but they have, uh, 10 to 20,000 vectors per snapshot. We have 200 snapshots. So that's expensive. They cannot always get that. And the question is, can we use the techniques we developed, the SAIV, to reduce the number? And, and, and what's the limit? Reduce the number of data points. So what we'll do here in the, on this slide, we're going to reduce, sorry, we're going to reduce the resolution. We downsample by up to 120 times. So you can see, instead of using this data, I use a few data, 100, about 100 da uh, data points, 100 particles. You can use the vectors of the initial particles. So can I just have 100, 100 points and construct using AIV the 3D flow of, of the entire flow? And, and in fact, get the pressure, which is the, they don't, cannot get the pressure out, but I can get the pressure. The answer is yes. These are the kind of pictures that we get. Looks like DNS, but it's not DNS. This is actually based on this data. You can see if you have 16,000 vectors, you get pretty good uh, uh, reconstruction. But even if you have 64 times less data per snapshot, only 250 vectors, you, you see the potential core, you see the, the, the uh, breakdown, uh, and even 100 vectors would give you a pretty good. In fact, if we look at the... Um, visualizations here. Uh, this, is, this is now experimental data reconstructed using this technique. And, and the data down here, I only have 100 particles per snapshot. So you can see that uh, we're missing some details uh, with the, um, you know, if you have very few particles, but actually all the salient features of this flow, the potential core, the, the vortex breakdown and so on, all, all that is uh, there. Um, you can get, as I said, you can get uh, the 3D pressure from here, which is uh, great. So, so this is kind of what I wanted to, to tell you about <clears throat> on this part. Uh, uh, Liana, I want to ask you how much time do I have so I can, I want to present at least one more problem. Oh, no problem. No problem. We are not limited by the time. <laughs> that okay. Part. Okay. Yeah. All right. So what I try to present is one, a couple of versions of this new thinking, a paradigm shift, where we don't use grids, we use physics, as much physics as we know. Um, you can parameterize the physics. For example, what happens if you don't know if the fluid is Newtonian or non-Newtonian? Well, you can start with 
non-Newtonian fluid, you put parameters there, the parameters become hyperparameters. And if the data tells you that this is not a, a non-Newtonian fluid, these parameters will be zero. So in some sense, you actually discover hidden physics, and that's the name of, that's why we have this, this, this name also. But there's a, a bunch of different papers, there are hundreds of papers, not just by my group, by other groups, that have demonstrated that they can solve not just simple equations, but more complex equations and so on. The, um, for those of you who are interested in diving into this, there's a tutorial, a SIAM reviews paper, and there's also a library, it's called DeepXDE. And this library um, is explained. Uh, just to give you an idea, a typical CFD code will be tens or even 100,000 lines of code. DeepXD is about a couple of hundred dollars, uh, sorry, a couple of hundred uh, lines of code. Okay, so we reduce the amount of, of coding by thousands. And that's important because you can change the codes quickly. The national labs now are very excited about this because the national labs have codes that are million lines. So, so, so it's very difficult to maintain this type of codes. Uh, but anyway, this is a good way to start. And it's called DeepXD because X stands for anything. You can dial any equation, not just fluid mechanics, integral equations and other equations. And you can get uh, in, in 10 minutes, as I said, after you go through it, you can get uh, good answers. The industry, so this has been downloaded 300,000 times and so on. The industry is really into this and they, lots of small and big companies. We work very closely with ANSYS, which is the biggest software company and NVIDIA have their own version of the code and so on. But uh, in the remaining of the time, I would like to uh, provoke your thinking with some other concepts here. And this is, uh, is this a re are these real neural networks and how do we get to true intelligence? And, and, uh, and so we've, we've heard about machine learning, but probably you may not have heard of machine intelligence, causal inference, reasoning, and so on. But um, we're not there yet. A, a, a lot of, there's lots of talk in the media about generalized intelligence. I'm not gonna talk about that. I'm, talk I'm gonna talk about something more concrete and that is, can we go from mimicking one condition, like one boundary condition will give me one answer, I have one neural network. Can we go to a plurality of conditions for a certain flow, for example? Can we create, can we learn the operators, let's say the Navier-Stokes operators, so that if we supply this no operator we learn with data, it can give us lots of solutions in real time not waiting for hours, right now we have to wait for hours to get our answers. Oh, so that's sort of the motivation for the, this new how, and this will lead me to what we call deep operator network or deep onet, which we published um, in, in Nature Machine Intelligence. Now the construction that I show here, first, the human neuron looks like this, has the inputs, it's called uh, uh, branches or dendrite, dendrite uh, branches, then has a soma, it's called a trunk, and then has a synaptic output. So the resemblance here with what I have on the left is uh, this is a synaptic output. The input or the soma is this one. So also the output, sorry, the output where the, where the operations are done, the domain output. And then the inputs are here. So you can have many branches, but here I have just one branch. So I constructed this network uh, when uh, my, my uh, daughter was trying to avoid doing the calculus itself. So she asked me if I can design a neural network where they can do all these operators, Laplace transforms, uh, solve equations and so on. So that's why it has a historical significance. <laughs> so, so by operators here would mean an abier stokes we can mean a, a black box actually, a social system, for example, a system of systems, a digital twin, or just Laplace operator or just a, a integration and so on. So what we're talking about here is a kind of a different paradigm. What People are talking about so far is this top where we have one function in a finite dimensional space because we have data, map it to some other data. In the process, for example, in imaging, we get the, the neural network, that's the function basically. What we're talking about now is to change this paradigm to go from a function is now an input and the output will be functions. For example, the stress field everywhere, the pressure field everywhere. And the, the inputs will be boundary conditions or, or forcings or heat sources or, or different contamination sources which vary in space time. These are functions. So continuous inputs, continuous outputs. How do you do that? 
and and is that possible? Uh, and so I'm. I, I want to. Uh, there's a long story behind it because I was actually teaching a class and I was thinking about it in variational calculus. Can neural networks represent functionals? And then I couldn't get anywhere because, as you know, today's in today's culture we have blogs. We don't have actually papers. We look at read blogs, and the blogs say, "Oh yeah, it's so cool. Neural network can approximate a functional." Then the other blog says, "No, no, no, that's not possible." And then I found a really, really nice paper which was published back in the 90s when people were still trying to develop theorems, just like the universal functional approximation theorem I talked about earlier. I found a nice theorem by Chen and Chen from, from Fudan University in Shanghai that nobody ever cited. And the theorem was saying that, yes, neural networks can approximate functions with a single hidden layer, just like a function. And then I was, OK, now I've how about from functionals to operators? Because I'm really interested in operators. And then I've your Stokes operator, for example. Stokes operator. Well, then I found this other paper in 1995 where they show again rigorously with rigorous, beautiful mathematics that if you try a fun if you if you try to map a function, not data, a function from u to g of u of y, y will be the output space, then indeed there is a neural network which they propose that can approximate my operator g of u of y using two neural networks. One turns out to be the trunk. And you can see here sigma is the activation function. That tells you that's a neural network, but it's a hidden, a, sig a single layer. And then another one, which is the inputs. So the branch, just pretty much like what I I, uh, I show you here is a branch. And there's a, a trunk. They work together. The cross product gives the output. And this really is the universal approximation theorem for operators. Now, you say, how come and nobody discovered it? How it was never cited again? Why is this not so useful? Well, it, theoretically, it's extremely useful. Practically, it was not useful because it turns out that if you, you have the case of dimensionality because an operator, if you think of an operator that you parameterize with, let's say, 100, 100, in 100 dimensions, 100 parameters, that's, that's very, very difficult problem. It's called the case of dimensionality. So a single hidden layer we know now cannot express high dimensional functions. That's something that we learned in, in like 10, 15 years ago. But now we, we know that deep neural networks can express high dimensional uh, functions and, and, and operators, therefore. So what we did is to extend the theorem, to extend the theorem to deep neural networks, and we have to Proof, different proofs, what Chen and Chen did uh, constructively uh, uh, in, the in the early 90s. But before I go there, and, and why is that? Because the deep neural networks, both for the trunk and the branch, can beat the case of dimensionality if they are designed properly. Now, before I go there, here I put the math and the neural network because you can try different combinations. So this, this here will correspond to the trunk. This here, you can think of this as a coefficient that is computed by sampling your input by sampling, let's say, the pressure at different points, you can get uh, the, uh, this into the branch. Or you can have multiple branches, like the human neuron, and then the trunk. And again, we don't have any discretization. Everything is continuous. OK, so let's see what we actually need to do. And, and <clears throat> I'll, I'll show, I'll show a, a multi-phase flow, because I, I wanted to select an example that Roger <laughs> would be interested in, that is multi-phase flow bubble, bubbles. So I'm going to show you how you build bubbles with neural networks. But before we get there, what, what were we? Let's, let's uh, resume. What, recap what we're doing. We're taking a function u that could be an excitation, a forcing, a boundary condition that changes in time space, and map it to a g of u. Could be a conductivity or a hydraulic uh, con uh, conductivity in a porous medium. So, so for one excitation u, we have an output g of u. And then we try another one, and we get another one excitation, another output, another response. We do that a thousand times. So this is now supervised learning. I don't use any equations at this point. And then we said, after we learn the operator G after some point, if we're lucky, then we can ask the question now, you will give me a totally different excitation, different forcing, different input. Can I predict the output without further training? That's very important. 
because we want to this do in real time. Imagine you're driving an autonomous car. You want to do that in real time, real, 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 really real time, not almost real time. So that looks like impossible. But what saved the day is this idea of expressivity of the deep neural networks. And what we observed early on is that if you look da down here on panel B, for the input, I have to characterize my input with lots of points. Let's say 100 points per one dimensional function. But for the output, I only need a couple of points. And the, that's very important because you can imagine that the output would be experiments. So if I, for every function, if I have to do hundreds of experiments and I need 10,000 functions, 10,000 excitations, I will break the bank. So, but what we observed, and now we have the theory that shows that there's exponential convergence actually in the input space. We don't need that many label data to learn this. So here is an example. Let's say, you know, for the sake of my daughter, we try to do how to integrate functions. So we learn by you just hit a button and you get the answer. Of course, you can do it with Mathematica, but, but let's say you have u of t an integrand and, and you map u of x to this indefinite integral x. x is between zero and one, but I can take it between zero and infinity for Laplace transforms. So what we do to train the network, we take 100 sensors, which means 100 points to represent u of t. But then for g of u, this is of g of u, which is the s of x, only at one point. I only take one, I only for every function, I only compute the integral at one point, although it's an indefinite integral. And then I do that 10,000 times. And here you can see the error when you give me a new function. When it says training error, it means that for the data that we use for training. When it means testing, we use a function which is not the same function that we use for training. And you can see here, actually, for lots of functions, you can see that the difference, of course, the testing error is always uh, larger. But for the network that we design, this is called the generalization gap, is as small as possible. If you use a standard neural network, you can see you have a huge generalization gap. So, so this seems to work. Now, can we use that to do bubble dynamics and grow bubbles? And here, of course, I can use a video of bubbles or, or some, uh, some other, but uh, here I, I don't have data. So I use uh, the um, celebrated Rayleigh equation or the rayleigh plesse equation to generate bubbles. Okay, so, so what is given will be the, the pressure. And what I want is the, how fast the bubbles grow, R of T. And you can see here, of course, we have viscosity and so on. So it's a, uh, of course, you can solve this equation very quickly and you can do that. That's not the point. The point is to demonstrate if this deponent can actually learn this operator, right? So this is what we do here in the, here in the, uh, branch, we give it delta p. And then in the trunk, we give time. And sometimes we give the history of r of t, the previous times. But, but the output is r of t. So as I said, this is supervised learning. We have lots of data, pair, pairing data. After we train it with about 300 tra trajectories, here I have the details, about 3,000 uh, 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 points. But uh, this, this is now arbitrary new pressures. And these are different responses for the pressure. And you can see that this is not a trivial response. I have multi-ray dynamics. The, the bubble is breathing very fast in the beginning, and then it's radius decays. And these are three different excitations. In the background, you can see the exact solution of RP. So now we learn how to solve this, but we learn how to solve this really, really fast at zero time, as I said. Um, now, we were a little more ambitious. We wanted to, to grow bubbles from tiny bubbles to moderate bubbles to big bubbles. So the rayleigh plesse equation would be true for, this is the initial at rt equals zero. So the initial bubble, this is one micron here. So the rayleigh plesse will be valid here, the continuum limit. But below that, if you have a bubble like this, you have to have molecular dynamics simulations to grow bubbles. Now, one molecular dynamics, we use a, what's called dissipative particle dynamics, which is coarse grain molecular dynamics. It takes 50 hours on, on, on 32 processors to get one result. So we want to eliminate that cost. And we want, in fact, to construct a multi-scale operator. It doesn't, if you give me a pressure difference, if you give me the bubble to be in this regime, 
I should be able in no time to produce a bubble and, and produce a growth of the bubble. So first we need to check that indeed in this discrete regime, not the continuum regime, if we can learn how to do that. And, it, and you can see here, we, we learn actually the mid, the, the, average, the average radius of the bubble. We don't learn the stochastic fluctuations. That's even a more difficult problem, but we'll work on it. The, the thermal fluctuations, but, but the mean uh, radius, we can learn it very well. So with 50 DPD simulations, 50 times 50 hours, that's the training. But then after we do that, we want to, to um, put everything together. The problem is, and this is where the physics come in, because some people say, should we stop teaching fluid mechanics? The answer is no, 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 no. Um, the, you cannot really reconcile the two regimes, the continuum and so on, in training it. So, so we need to go back to the good old non-dimensionalization and find characteristic times. So unless you do that in the fluid mechanics version, and Martin Maxime, a colleague who knows a lot of fluid mechanics, uh, he, uh, came up with this characteristic time, then we have a domain. This is the initial radius. And this is now the characteristic time scale. And you can see now, although we span two and five orders of magnitude in space time, this domain, so these are the small scales, so it's very confined domain. So we don't need a lot of simulations. So basically, we can train the entire depot net to take data from the, the discrete regime, from the continuum regime. We don't do anything here at the interface. Usually, you do handshaking and so on. We just throw data at it from both sides. And here's a paper we published in General Fluid Mechanics last year. It shows that, indeed, this is the for any initial radius in microns. We can learn what's going on in the DP, in the discrete regime in the continuum regime and also at the interface is this overlapping region where we can actually have the um, the Rayleigh Plessé and the DPD gives you the same answer and Deponet also learn to do that and do it fast. So now you basically you have reduced the cost of 50 hours to about 0.01 seconds for new bubbles. So, so you can grow bubbles uh, anytime using this. Okay. Uh, don't want to brag about it. This is something that uh, Quant Magazine wrote about DeepoNet. Uh, it's a fast method and so on. We use in hypersonics and other applications. Uh, it's work funded by a center that I direct. It's physics informed learning machines, the Department of Energy now, the, we're in the fourth year, and also by a new MURI on learning, meta learning. And um, I also need to show you this because I. Uh, uh, some of my colleagues start a company, I'm part of it, so my university is requiring that I show that, otherwise they will fire me. So thank you very much for uh, your attention. Sorry, I took a little longer than, uh, than expected, but uh, I wanted to give you a little pers different perspective than before. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Kanidagis. This is really fantastic. Yeah, and uh, well, um, so uh, the floor is open for questions. And also, you know, okay, yeah, just feel free to unmute yourself if you want to ask your questions by yourself and you are strongly encouraged to do so. And also you can type in questions in the chat. Yeah, okay. And uh, well, okay, Ooh, but before we go there, okay, let me just uh, say, well, Roger, the story Professor George Kandakis said about you, this is not the first time I heard uh, such kind of stories. I also heard it from other very well established uh, fluid dynamicist and they told me that uh, back then they could just went to talk to you and got a project <laughs> from NSF. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. So, and also actually I want to uh, thank Professor uh, Kanidakis, you know. Well, we are now talking about the 20 years of time frame. 20 years ago, when I was at the eighth, late stage of my graduate study and postdoc, okay, when I was on job market, <laughs> then Professor Kanidakis gave me very, very good advice about how to do job interviews. <laughs> <And> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right, now the floor is open for questions. Who wants to start first? Well, I do have some questions, Lian. Yeah, Adisha. And oh, by the way, Adisha is the chair of the SAFOS seminar committee. And Adisha, thank you so much for putting up 
after this very nice seminar series. Of, of, of course, my pleasure. I should thank Georgia for accepting our invitation. It was such an honor. Um, uh, well, um, I have too many questions, but I can't find them to a few. So from what I have learned, maybe I'm wrong. I'm just looking at it from an optimization angle that you have a dynamic system and you have a bunch of observation. In classic ways, we have initial condition, boundary conditions. We integrate the forward equation and then predict. But the way that you present, all right, we have a neural network that can learn this dynamical system and we don't have to have necessarily initial and boundary condition on all the grid points that make it a completely determined problem. So my question is that you're solving it in an undet as, as an undetermined problem, as still it's undetermined, the physics info, or it becomes overdetermined because we have an observation cost function, we have a mean squared, a squared observation, yeah, and yeah. the other one was trying to set the forward equation to zero to, through the neural network. So my question is that, is it eventually an overdetermined problem or underdetermined problem? Yeah, so in all neural networks, mm -hmm. uh, you have overparameterization. Mm -hmm, if mm -hmm. uh, anybody doesn't have an overparameterized neural network, it mm -hmm. means that they just feed the data. Mm -hmm. They're not learning. The key to learning, when I say learning, so they can generalize to other cases, is that you have um, over-parameterization. <laughs> so that, that, that's number one. So it's, it's always, that, so, so, it's, so, so you always have more degrees of freedom than data. Oh, Otherwise, and that's very important, actually. There's, mm -hmm. a, there's, a, there's a theory, it's called the information bottleneck theory, mm -hmm. that explains that, finally explain that, why is that? Uh, I mean, Hinton, one of the forefathers of AI, was saying that for, for a long time. And all the applied statisticians thought that he was heretic. And then he gave them the argument. He said, look, we live about 10 to the 9 seconds, let's say, in our lifetime. So even if we learn one, one, one data per second, one image per second, we have 10 to the 15 uh, uh, synapses, <laughs> parameters in our brain. We have many more parameters in our brain than, mm. than, than the data that we receive in our, in our ent entire <laughs> lives. So you mm. need to be over parameterized. When he was saying that, too, there's a meeting where in the mm. statisticians in the 90s that Jeff Hinton was working and all the statisticians avoided him, like he was an heretic. Heretic. Like never, now everybody knows that we have to have more parameters. Mm. And the reason is that because when you do the optimization, the data induces you to go to a global minimum. Mm -hmm. not to a minimum, not, I shouldn't say global, not hopefully a global minimum. But in the process, because of this stochastic uh, way we solve the stochastic gradient descent, you visit places that you wouldn't, vi you wouldn't uh, visit if you had an underdetermined or, or, or a deterministic system. So the overparameterization allows you to have large fluctuations in the gradients mm -hmm. that allow you to go to different slopes and different valleys and learn something about the system that you wouldn't learn otherwise. So that's the key, and there's now strong theoretical evidence of that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Adesha. I have more questions, but I'm gonna open the floor for others. So, um, uh, doctor, I have a more of a pedestrian question. And Dr. Dahaj did. Uh, global uh, climate models are infamous for the amount of time and the amount of computer space that they require. And has your uh, PINS technique been applied by you or by others to develop a more efficient global climate model? Thanks, John. This, this is a question <laughs> uh, of an insider because actually we have a DARPA project right now with um, PNNL and uh, MIT that we're looking at tipping points in, uh, in climate and we're trying to do exactly that because the, 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 we want to do like um, a three kilometer resolution which will take forever to simulate uh, 10 years. And of course, we're talking about hundreds of years. Uh, and with, uh, but, uh, so we, but we can do a hundred kilometers. Problem is a hundred kilometers, you only have half a point in the state of Rhode Island where Brown is. So you cannot resolve anything. So that's a huge uncertainty. So we're trying to use somewhere there, not, not pins, but deponet actually, 
that learns this from, from all the conditions that we have historical data to learn a nudging factor, a nudging factor that will take this uh, from, from historical, from tropical, from cyclones and, 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 and uh, other extreme conditions. We're trying to include those uh, events also. So, um, to, um, so they, we haven't succeeded yet, but that's one effort. Uh, yesterday, actually, we were lucky to, uh, there was an announcement by the Department of Energy of our new center, uh, the DOE Center at PNNL in Sandia. I'm the director. And it's actually on exactly this topic that you're talking about, how we can use uh, DeepoNet as part of, the, you don't abandon everything. You don't abandon the physics and the model, but you accelerate certain parts so you can actually improvise for subgrid resolutions, um, phenomena that stat from statistical learning you can capture and so on. There's always the danger that you can compute something faster, which is wrong. <laughs> so we can always compute the wrong answer faster. But of course, we're developing mathematics like uncertainty quantification and so on, trying to safeguard some of it. It's a difficult problem. Thank you. Thank you, John. Oh, sorry, I have a question. Yeah. Ali, go ahead. Yeah, very interesting talk. Thank you, Professor Konya Dankis. Uh, you said our our goal is uh, to solve the imposed problem, right? All mm -hmm. of the problems are imposed. So, how much information we need? For example, in this in the case of the uh, flow, you say that from the surface temperature, you could reconstruct the velocity field, right? Right. So, my question is that how much information we need to reconstruct the problems? Is it that particular problem is, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 look, there's always the danger of misspecification. For example, would you use a shallow water equation? Would you use a, a, a full Navier Stokes? Would you use 3D and so on? So, so that's where the difficulty comes in. That's where the modeler should come in and, and, and uh, use judgment and compare with, with data. Of course, we have other observations and data that one can compare. But it, it's a very difficult question to know in general, to answer that in general. So, but, but for example, something that is weird, right? Because I, I teach boundary value problems and I always tell people uh, that we have to have boundary conditions. Otherwise you have an ill posed problem, we cannot solve it. We prove with pins that we can solve boundary value problems without boundary conditions. We can converge in L2 sense if we have a couple of points inside the domain to anchor the solution. Of course, if you don't have boundary conditions, then, then you, anything can. But if you have a few sporadic points, no boundaries, just a few points. So we have actually, a theorem that says that we converge in the L2 sense if we don't have boundary conditions, but just a couple of a thing of heat equation with just a, a couple of thermocouples, we can still get the whole field in the L2 sense. If you have boundary conditions, then you converge in H1 sense much faster. So that, that's something that we have actually, it's a rigorous proof. To say in general what happens, it, it's almost impossible. It will, it will, so you have to sort of go by the type of equations. It's hyperbolic equations are, you know, wave propagation. Uh, it's, it's, uh, that, uh, what's the method of character? You know, the characteristics. All this, all this has to take, be taken into account. In other words, uh, and 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 there's a lot of hype, uh, and and try. I try in my talks not to hype it too much because there's a lot already too much hype. Uh, but there's a lot of hype, and and then you have to use sort of judiciously fundamental mathematics. And observations to to come up with the question that you ask, which is a very difficult question to answer. In general, thank you. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, a quick question. Thanks so much for a really really interesting talk. I really really enjoyed it. Um, how well do these PINN methods uh, deal with poor quality experimental data as the input? So where you you talked about dealing with sparse data input. And, uh, and you know, like uh, incomplete boundary conditions. Um, but what if the input data, the experimental data, is is of low quality, of high error? How well can these kind of regression methods deal with that? And do you need more sophisticated flow to deal right, with right. the low quality in there? Yeah. So, so, so we we actually have addressed this uh, in a series of papers. I didn't have time to show it here, but the um, uh, so first of all, if it's noisy data with zero mean no bias, then up to 10%, these this pins can tolerate up to 10% noise, which is pretty pretty good actually. 
And the reason is because of the regularization term. There's a regularization term that you put because of the, the system is undetermined, as we said earlier. So, so that's one thing. Now, if you have a bias in the data, how would you deal with the bias? Mm -hmm. Well, we introduce a, something we call multi-fidelity because we realize that you're never going to have a lot of high fidelity data. Let's say I, I was interested in, and uh, Leah knows the, um, uh, the Boston Harbor used to be very, very dirty. And so we had this project, mm -hmm. <laughs> the, der the dirtiest harbor in the country. That's what uh, George uh, Bush the Elder uh, said to Mike Dukakis <laughs> once. But anyway, so we, had a, we have a project. We still have a project on ocean acidification in the Boston oh. Harbor. Okay. And we're interested in pH. We're, you're not going to go out and have uh, uh, hundreds of pH sensors. <laughs> so, so you have three, three pH sensors expensive. $10,000 each. And then we have a bunch of $100, $100 sensors. So what we did is a, it's like a pyramid. You have the high fidelity data, the few mm -hmm. expensive sensors we call computer science called the gold data, and then the bronze or silver data, which we have many more. And then we can even have simulations. So you, you build a pyramid. So multi fidelity or multi modality data helps you with what you're talking about. If you just mm -hmm. have all biased data, there's not much you can do because you'll bias mm -hmm. the physics, you'll find the wrong term in the physics. But if you have yes. a few points to anchor your solution and lots of other points, noisy and so on, you can deal with uh, much better than the standard um, adjoint methods and other data simulation techniques, which are good, but but they have this hiccup. Yeah, makes sense. Thanks so much. By the way, Nate is a postdoc doing Experimental fluid dynamics. <laughs> yeah, late, later today I have a, a meeting with uh, Julio Soria from uh, from uh, Australia, Monash University, and CSRO, who's doing who's one hundred percent experimentalist, and he wants to use the technique I I show you with the with the, with the jet to to produce uh, the pressure. <laughs> so so yes now we can we get the pressure i think something something that we couldn't easily get it's a byproduct of this yeah it's a really it's a really really valuable method i think for yeah circumstances where you can get some experimental data uh yeah. but uh, you, know, you can get rare experimental data from the field maybe but you can't fill in the rest uh with any other kind of method right uh, so 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 the older idea was to either with uh linear interpolation or the data or more sophisticated interpolation or in throwing some physics here. Now you blend the physics and data in a seamless way. That's basically it. And then neural networks enable you to do that hmm. in a non-linear fashion, not, not, not linear stuff. If I could ask one more quick question, guys, that, that's related to that. Uh, can you can you reproduce or how well, you, you mentioned turbulent boundary layers very briefly, uh, but how well in turbulence can you capture and you know, the small scale features in the flow the, you know if you have sparse data no, uh, no, yeah so you know, locally that? yeah that's 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 an open question uh, Nathan uh, that's um locally turbulence uh so so neural networks have seen something I, I mentioned earlier this spectral bias that they they fail to to um adequately resolve high frequencies they mm. don't have the accuracy of spectral methods for example so that that sort of limits their capacity to do turbulent simulations at a fine scale. Uh, there are other things you can do to improvise and so on, but uh, but uh, yeah, that's a, it's still an open question. I, I there are lots of people who have meetings and say, okay, use the neural networks to to solve the problem of turbulence. I, I don't go to those meetings. Okay, thank you. Questions from anyone? Well, the interest of time, you know, because I noticed that both Vinny and Professor George Kanidakis, they live on the East Coast. So they are one hour ahead of us. So we should not hold them for too long. <laughs> and uh, well, this is a really great talk. And uh, well, Vinny, congratulations again. It's always a great pleasure to have you as a student, as a sample, and the best wish to you for the rest of your study and your next stage of career. And uh, Professor Kanidakis, thank you so much for giving your talk. Thank you very much. And I just want to say 
uh, to Roger all the best and uh, stay healthy and attend their meetings every year. <laughs>